Good morning and welcome to Rising. Emily, I think this is going to be one of our greatest shows ever because we get to talk about good news and Joe Manchin, which we don't get to do very often. So what else do we have, though? You know, we do talk about Joe Manchin often, though. <laughs> that, that's hardly rare. Well, good. We have a, we have a big Almost show today. Almost as today. much as Joe Rogan. Yeah. <laughs> the two critical Joes. Um, well, that's actually right where we're starting today. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the, the bill that was passed in the Senate yesterday, or the deal that we know is uh, you know looming in the Senate when it comes to Joe Manchin and when it comes to Chuck Schumer. Um, this has been, it went from the $4 billion to $2 billion and now to about, I'm sorry, $4 Four trillion to two trillion to now about uh, three hundred and eighty billion. And Ryan, I'm really eager to get your take on all of that. We're going to be talking um, also about the shifts in how people are thinking uh, of the origins of COVID. We talked a little bit a little bit about that with Robbie and Bree yesterday, but we're going to do more of it today. We're talking about Facebook, uh, I should say Meta, actually, and changes they're making mm -hmm. to the platform. So we've got a lot on the docket for this morning, this this great Friday, summer Friday. Uh, um, and I think we should start with Mansion, don't you, Ryan? <laughs> I know you want to. I do, I do. Let's let's, and we'll and we'll be talking later about the kind of Mansion machinations that that got us to this this remarkable place, uh, where we're on the brink of seeing, you know, landmark climate legislation and tax reform stuff going through a Congress that everybody thought was basically just done uh, for the year and not just for the year, but probably for Biden's entire term. So, uh, yeah, let's let's run through the deal. You know, it, it, it all the mainstream media will call it a kind of climate and taxes bill and we'll kind of leave it at that. But let's let's go kind of bullet by bullet and, and run through these and tell, tell me what you think of them. Uh, we could start with the drug pricing deal. This is actually a pretty big deal itself. You know, Democrats in 2006 decided that they were going to run on allowing uh, Medicare to negotiate lower drug prices. So, you know, they were going to lower drug prices for seniors. 2006, they've been running on that. When they took, when they finally took power, they cut a deal with the pharmaceutical industry that they would not do that in exchange for pharma's support for Obamacare. Uh, here it is. It's, it's going to be in the bill. It's going to save something like a hundred plus billion dollars a year. It's not. It, it's only going to focus on a couple of dozen expensive drugs, uh, but the amount of money that it saves suggests that it is going to have kind of a ripple effect throughout the industry. What do you make of uh, pharma taking an L here? You know, ph pharma the, is probably the most powerful lobby in Washington D.C. because this is not a place that they're accustomed to being. Well, and do they have Joe Manchin's number? <laughs> no, this is a, a great it's point, not. actually. Right, and, and so the fact that Manchin is sort of the critical point in this deal um, that has this element that takes on pharma, I guess makes me suspicious of the enforcement teeth, uh, because as you just said, mm -hmm. Ryan, it's not, I mean, it's not what Democrats would like, um, and I think it's not what a lot of Democratic voters would like, certainly, but it is also one of those things we were talking before the show that I would love to see a piecemeal vote on. Um, so many of these items, mm -hmm. I would love, like the what they're doing with the carried interest uh, tax, like there's a long time loophole right. of carried interest tax that's going to hit PE um, in particular. And I would love to see some of these sort of piecemeal things in this era of the realignment, in this era of the Republican Party, uh, the, the base of the Republican Party becoming more working class and the base of the Democratic Party becoming more sort of suburban and uh, wealthy. I would love to see piecemeal votes on things like the Medicare negotiations and like carried interest, um, because I suspect it would pressure Republicans um, to probably some chunk of Republicans, mm -hmm. maybe like 10 Republicans to come to the table right. on that. Right, right, because it does expose this, the contradiction, like are you a working class party or are you the, are you the party of, of the elites, of private equity, of hedge funds? And, and for people who, who don't know what the carried interest loophole is, basically hedge funds and private equity firms and, and some other kind of investment partnerships have figured out a way to basically take their salaries but call them long-term capital gains. Even if, like hedge funds, they're they're trading stocks like every couple minutes. Uh, they what they do is they create several different layers removed from those trades and say, well, we're not we're not the ones trading those. Our shares are in this partnership. We're going to hold a long-term interest in that partnership. It's an investment. Therefore, it's a capital gain. Therefore, uh, a regular person, uh, you know, a you know, a teacher in New Jersey might pay 37 percent on their uh, on, on their income, federal federal taxes. We're going to only pay 20 percent. And so they get this massive tax break 
And because of this loophole, it has kind of distorted the entire market and, and created this entire industry of people uh, who can make lower returns than their competitors, but still make more money because they're gaming the tax code. Now, this doesn't completely close the loophole. It, it, makes, some, it makes some changes to it, which is why it only raises, they, they said, four, I think 14 billion is the estimate over 10 years. Uh, but this has been kind of the, maybe the second most difficult thing for Congress to get done uh, other than drug pricing reform, because obviously the private equity and hedge fund lobby, it's extremely powerful in Washington. Uh, their, their last hope is that Kirsten Sinema uh, will step in and do something about it. But it doesn't I, it's hard for me to see her doing that. Um, was, what do you what do you what's what do you think? I think it's also hard to see her doing that because at this point the incentives uh, have shifted and they really gave her something. I mean, this is this is intentionally crafted um, in the negotiations with Senator Manchin. They got to a place, Chuck Schumer got to a place where this is very intentionally crafted to make it easy for them to vote and to make it really hard for them to vote no. Not only is it easy, did they try to make it easy for them to vote affirmatively on, but they tried to make it really hard for them to vote uh, negatively on something. And so, yeah, I, I feel mm -hmm. like the incentive. That said. Um, that does. That, there is room for a poison pill. Uh, there's absolutely room for a poison pill. It takes one little thing that cinema feels could crush her in Arizona. Um, that would get that, that could get added to the, the bill. That could get added in the negotiate. Whatever it is, it, these are fragile. When any time you have um, a majority this thin, the negotiations become incredibly fragile. And so I'm also curious what you think about uh, how they how they handle cinema going forward. Right. I mean, there, there's for a long time been this idea, which has merit of of the rotating villain that the system uh, will throw up, uh, you know, an, an individual senator as the kind of face of the opposition to a particular thing and everybody else will hide behind them. And then you knock down that villain. And all of a sudden there's a there's a new one coming up. So Manchin, you get Manchin on board. Now, all of a sudden, Menendez has a problem with the drug pricing. You get Menendez on board. Then you've got cinema having a problem with this. Uh, but what the rotating villain misses is that if you actually do kind of cleave off these villains and and get their public support then you can only rotate through so many and so now D democrats have really by getting mansion on board they've really isolated gottheimer in the house to the point where you know he has very little uh, room to maneuver because he how, how's he going to say that he's that mansion is not you know a reasonable credible figure on on these on these issues but it also isolates Kirsten Cinema. You know, Cinema could play her games while Manchin was also holding out. But now that Manchin's on board, kind right. of fun and games are over. And sh and Cinema is an extraordinary fundraiser, no doubt about it. And she gets a decent amount of money from kind of Republican leaning billionaires. But most of her money comes from partisan Democrats, and people forget that. And so that means that there is a weapon that Schumer, Pelosi and the Democratic Biden, the Democratic leadership, you know, have against cinema. You know, if cinema bucks them on this, they can they can tell those donors like this. This is over. Like this is the bill that we want. If you take this down, if cinema takes this down and you continue giving money to Kirsten Cinema, then you're persona non grata. Like Huge all of the leverage. money that you've given to the yeah, all the money you've given to the Democratic Party that, you know, that now they might be bluffing. And they might say, no, it, we lost. We need your money. You can come back later. Uh, but it, it's a it's a threat that I think a lot of these people are not going to want to watch. And also, even even though these people are you know super wealthy, some of these partisan donors, you know, would actually like to see Democrats succeed at something, even if it even if it costs them a little bit of money. Because so they think I, I think she's a bit isolated. Right, because they think this correlates with their ability to win particular races and to maybe hold on right. to the Senate in the midterms. And if the power is on makes, the table, right. you want this huge right. talking point going into the fall. I'm going to read the Republican National Committee Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel's statement. She said, Joe Biden and Democrats want to raise taxes during a recession. Biden lied, denied, and deflected the blame for skyrocketing prices and the and recession they created. I do think, Ryan, um, that from cinema's perspective, this this framing 
is not helpful mm -hmm. to Democrats. And that's something, if it builds and becomes, if that gets traction um, with voters, that line that this is on the same day that we have numbers showing we've basically entered a recession, Democrats are passing $380 billion of spending, which as the mansion got the name changed to the Inflation Reduction Act, so whether or not it's inflationary is a different question. It would raise taxes, whether or not you think those taxes are uh, just or otherwise. And I think it's interesting that the CHIPS bill was passed on the same day that this, this deal was announced. I keep saying bill was passed. This deal was announced. Um, and the CHIPS bill is interesting because it talks about how much labor has been offshored and how much manufacturing has been offshored. It tries to ad address that in semiconductor manufacturing for in the interest of national security. Um, Republicans have said, you know, cited the Reagan line that uh, spending, defense spending isn't spending, whatever the actual, I was paraphrasing it, but that it's not a budgetary concern, basically, I think is the line. Um, but at the same time, raising corporate taxes is what sent a lot of those jobs overseas. And these are serious in the first place, because labor is cheaper and in some very unethical ways and in some ways that are ethical. There are reasons that it's, it's uh, people have gone elsewhere. I think we should have strong middle class jobs, uh, manufacturing jobs in this country, there's no question about it. I think we need to bring a whole lot of them back. Um, I do think there's something to be said for passing corporate tax hikes while you're trying to bring jobs back to the United States. Um, I, I have no pity at all for the corporations, but for the workers, this does affect that. Um, and so this is kind of an interesting confluence of events culminating on a late Thursday in July. Yeah, yeah I, I think Democrats would have two decent rebuttals to that. One would be and this goes to another piece of the, the legislation, they've, they've created a 15%, and this is the corporate tax increase that she's return, referring to, a 15%, basically alternative minimum corporate tax, and it's global. Yep. And so if you want to offshore your, uh, you know, your manufacturing because you think you can dodge taxes in the United States, with this in place, that actually no, ladder, no longer works. So you're still gonna get hit with those same taxes. So if all things are equal, you could do your, your manufacturing here in the US and then there could be some subsidies in order to do that. On the messaging side, the timing is pretty good for Democrats in the sense that we're now in earnings season. And so you've already started to see oil companies, I think Valero came, was out yesterday, uh, talking about how they basically made more than a billion dollars a month this last quarter. Uh, and you haven't even gotten yet to you know Exxon Shell and the other big boys. And these are gonna make giant headlines where you're going to say, where you're going to see over the last quarter, these companies making historic profits, 10, 20, 30 billion dollars. And so when Republicans say we can't raise corporate taxes because we're in a recession, Democrats be like, these guys have been gouging prices. Oil prices have come down more than gas prices have. And guess where the difference is? Hmm. The difference has gone in the pockets of these oil companies. We need to hit them with this win and they can call it a windfall tax. It's it, it's the thing that, uh, you know, Democratic operatives are saying is polling absolutely through the roof, taxing oil companies for their for their windfall profits. And so if they can slot into that frame, they'll have they'll have better luck. I think you're right that that cinema has said we can't raise taxes or blah, 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 you know, like that. That is what she will try to do. We'll see if she has the kind of. Uh, you know, wherewithal or the or the willpower to stand up to uh, Democrats. Uh, let's see what what else we got. We haven't or, even got. Or if she the, thinks her voters uh, are buying that too, and that's her big. I mean, obviously that's her big mm -hmm. uh, incentive. I mean, any politicians, but that's her big concern in a, in a state she feels is fairly purple. Nobody seems to even be able to figure out if she's what what her <laughs> what she's concerned about because uh, she's you know in a swing state she has like completely torpedoed her support among Democrats to the point where, you know, she's probably going to get primaried by Ruben Gallego uh, and, you know, very likely could lose uh, if she votes for it. You know, that could be the only thing that really, you know, takes some of the wind out of a, a Gallego primary challenge. And she's not up till 2024 anyway. Um, I mean, the, again, so I the do last think there's piece, a... Yeah. I do think there's a chunk of voters who yeah. really like this was going to be four trillion dollars. Then it was going to be two trillion dollars. And I do think with a and that was with the recession looming. Um, mm -hmm. We knew the economy was not going in a great direction, even though Janet Yellen tried to downplay it and Biden himself tried to downplay it. Uh, people sensed that and there were, was plenty of evidence for it. So I do think there is a chunk of the electorate that would be grateful to Manchin and Cinema um, for getting winnowing it down to a more workable bill in this type of economy. 
yeah, yeah, and and hey, maybe maybe that counts as this. Maybe the massive ambitions that they started with. Remember, I think uh, it wasn't Bernie Sanders calling for like ten trillion and then six trillion. Yeah. Uh, so hey, Mansion is is the moderate here, bringing it down to. I guess the whole package is something like 700, with you know, counting the deficit reduction and and all the other stuff. So hey, there you go. Call it call it a centrist, moderate, reasonable package, and and move on. And meanwhile, we're looking at the biggest climate investment the U.S. has has ever made, which we could talk about maybe in the next segment. We've gone a little long here. Sorry about <laughs> we haven't gone a little long, but you know what? This is a great this is a great transition into it because I feel similarly about the global minimum tax as I do about climate spending. So we'll we'll get to that. <laughs> this segment um, coming up soon. But any other final thoughts before we uh, transition, Ryan? No, but yeah, I say people should stick around for the next the next one because the the move that they pulled on McConnell, uh, I think really lifts the mask off this mas- this alleged master of the Senate. We, we sh- you know, Ra- Rachel Bovard has long been kind of saying that the, the McConnell emperor really wears no clothes, that he's not the brilliant strategist that that people uh, you know from left to right say that he is and you know if and he got massively snookered and outplayed uh by democrats here and, and you know we'll, we'll talk about that later in the show so you eagerly awaiting that discussion <laughs> we'll be back can't wait for that one no truly truly can't wait for that one we'll be back with more rising right after this <laughs> 